Good evening. The legacy of waiting well. That's the subject we're going to look at this evening. And we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 to 7. Have you ever climbed to the top of a hill to a significant viewpoint? And together with the panoramic view, there's also a visual guide as to what can be seen. And it's got pointers to each of the landmarks that lie across the land before you. It really helps to understand where you are in relation to the surrounding places. And I find much more is apparent when I seek out the landmarks shown on the diagram. In verses 1 to 3 of the passage that we're looking at tonight, it describes just such a scene with God as the guide pointing out to Moses all of the significant landmarks across the land that he's going to give to the children of Israel after all of those years of trials and waiting. God has led Moses up to the top of Mount Nebo, it's almost 3,000 feet high, with a commanding view of the territory and land surrounding them. Miraculously, God also expands Moses' view to beyond his natural view, supernaturally showing him places that would physically be impossible to see from that point. Looking at verse 4, this is a momentous occasion. The actual time and place when God would finally confirm his delivery of the promise made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob regarding the promised land, which had been carried over generations. I did wonder as I looked at this, is as God spoke, perhaps Moses would have hoped that he would relent and allow him to experience that which he had dreamed of, worked towards and waited for all his life. But alas, there is instead confirmation that Moses were not experienced a crossing into the promised land and that his earthly life would now end. It may seem harsh to us, knowing God's love and in particular his love for and special friendship with Moses, that he would prevent him from completing that which God himself had set aside him to do, that is lead the children of Israel through to the promised land. But if you look back to Numbers 20, verses 1 to 13, which I call, in true Sherlock Holmes style, the incident at Meribah, you will see that Moses did not follow God's precise instruction. At the critical moment when God wanted a word spoken to the rock to produce water for those grumbling Israelites, Moses instead did his own thing, and in his own strength he struck the rod Onto the, onto the rock. So he used his staff rather than a word. So why was God so offended and responded with such severe discipline? Well, maybe in Zechariah 4, 6, where it says, not by force, not by strength, but by my spirit, there could be a clue here. Moses' action with his rod could have pointed to his own strength, power, or even powers in the rod rather than God's power. Those with great anointing and with great responsibility for leading others carry a high expectation from God. At this key moment in front of the whole assembly, Moses disobediently did it his way and not God's way. And that is sin. There is consequence to sin and disobedience. And for Moses, that meant missing out. On his dream. Despite God's judgment and discipline, his friendship throughout his life and his relationship with God remained. He accepted God's discipline. He didn't become disgruntled, resentful. He didn't grumble. He didn't try to negotiate on his own behalf. Compare that with when he pleaded for the children of Israel in Exodus 34, 11 to 14, when the Lord was so angry that he was going to destroy them. But after Moses' pleading, God relented. Moses just instead turned to God with openness, love, trust and a desire to do better. True repentance. He carried on waiting patiently for God's timing and purposes to be fulfilled. Now at the end of Moses' life, and we see this in verses 5 and 6, we see that God quietly takes him away 
and honours him, his dear friend, with a personal burial. God knows that Moses has become a significant figure, both then and for all time. And he doesn't want him to become a focal point for worship in his own right after his death. Things like a shrine and pilgrimage and all those sort of things could come up. It is important to note that in verse 7, it makes the point of saying that Moses was not worn out or spent. God wasn't just moving him aside for a younger man. He was more than capable of completing the mission. He was 120 years old, but still full of passion and vigour. So after a life of waiting, what was Moses' legacy? Well, firstly, I would suggest that he completed his life's mission given by God. His passion for and commitment to freedom from captivity of his people never subsided. It bubbled over as he impatiently waited as a young man into angry violence and murder. It was followed by years of waiting and preparation from the light, away from the limelight where he increased his depth of relationship with God, his friend, and increased his dependency on him until, as an old man, he was now ready for God's calling to lead the greatest mission. The second significant legacy left by Moses was his passing on of God's model for society through the law and the structures to go with it. He had a unique role as an intermediary between God and his people. Thirdly, Moses prepared well for passing the mission on, preparing a capable, anointed, God-chosen successor in Joshua. But finally, and maybe most of all, he models true relationship with God, a close friendship that we can all desire and has now been made available to us all through his son. And what was Moses' reward? Well, he lived and died a friend of God. He alone experienced that face-to-face relationship. God states it himself in Numbers 12, verse 8. After his death, this relationship obviously continued. And in Matthew 17, 1 to 3, his relationship with the Son is also revealed as he and Elijah talk with Jesus in the transfiguration. Now we can have an even more intimate relationship with God through Jesus, friend of sinners, and the Holy Spirit actually dwelling within us, speaking directly into our hearts. In John 10, 27 to 28, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Let's live our lives listening to his voice, being known by him, trusting his direction, following with patience, waiting for God's ultimate plan for us to be revealed and fulfilled. And if we are disciplined along the way, or when we go through trials, let's keep our loving focus on him. I hope you have a nice evening thinking about Moses' life and death. I've left you a few questions to consider. Thanks for listening. Bye.